Hi, everyone, and welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live video cast where we talk with people from all walks of the industry, the publishing industry. I'm Christy Stratus, historical fantasy and historical suspense author. Apparently, I don't know who I am. I'm like struggling to remember me <laughs> because I was, I'm a Victorian lady tonight, as you can tell. Um, my awesome co-hosts are epic fantasy author Richard H. Stevens and sci-fi author David M. Kelly. And Lurking for right. Legends is an interactive broadcast. And we encourage viewers to chime in with questions for our guests and comment on what you hear in the show. And tonight is our favorite episode. We love doing live reads and tonight is the live read in case you couldn't tell. I wish I just was why every day, <laughs> but anyway, tonight is <laughs> our live awesome. read. We have two guests tonight. Very exciting. We are bringing back DC Gomez and Mark Leslie, and we're going to read from three works. We're going to read from one each of theirs and one of mine, which is why I'm all dressed up like this. So first, we're just going to quickly talk about what is up with us. Um, do you guys have anything new this week, either of you? What have you been up to? Yeah, I wanted to, uh, this is something very awesome. I came home today and uh, uh, someone messaged me. I didn't know who they were. And I'm going to try and share my screen. So bear with me. I was trying to do this uh, before we went on. And I think I've got it now. So uh, last yesterday was Halloween. And uh, someone actually dressed up as Rika. And this oh. is this is uh, some uh, some young reader who bought uh, Rika's flight at oh. the Eden Mills Writers Festival. I did that with That's David. Cool. Uh, in September, and I've never met them before, and uh, she seemed all excited, and she's an inspiring author herself, and I got this message today when I got home that uh, this is her costume from yesterday. She was Rika Drakreen from Rika's Flight, and that was so amazing. I just, I, I, I have goosebumps even talking about it, so it's uh, oh, so, so cool. cool. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah that, that's about it with me. I, I'm still working at, on the beginning of uh, uh, When Legends Rise, so it'll be out maybe in eight, ten months. That's awesome. How about you, Dave? Um, for me, well, it's November, so I've now switched to uh, working on the third in the uh, Logan's World series. I'm now working on the second draft of that. So um, it's kind of a, a dual kind of thing. It's like, so I'm writing Hyperia half of the day, and the other half I'm editing Logan. So it, cool. I hope they don't get confused. <laughs> <laughs> it makes them two up. Yeah, you get the tentacle creature with Logan. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. <laughs> now, but you first. Cool, yeah, I have um, the next episode of Corrupted Magic is up, and Corrupted Magic is what we're going to be reading from tonight. We're going to read a whole episode, Yay. and this week uh, it was episode fifteen, which is called Ultimatum. Um, so that one is now up, and I. I think that's about it. NaNoWriMo has started. I do participate every year, but I set my own goal. I don't go for the 50,000. I just try to write every single day. And, uh, you know, I wrote a whole bunch this morning on, let's see, episode 20, I think, of Corrupted Magic. So um, we're in the rising action now and I'm to the climax and I'm super, super excited about it. So it's coming really fast. You know, it's so much easier awesome. when you're all excited. That's so fantastic. I think, yeah, I think that's pretty much what's up with me. So... Let's bring our guests in. Uh, and like I said, we have DC Gomez and Mark Leslie tonight. Um, they have already introduced themselves to you in other episodes, but it would be great if you guys could introduce yourselves again, just for anybody who didn't catch those episodes. So DC, could you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm DC Gomez. I'm actually coming from guests from East Texas. So I'm super excited to join you all. I'm in multi-genre kind of author. So I do everything from urban fantasy to women's fiction, everything from children's as well as devotional. So I'm kind of really excited to be here with everybody. So hi. Excellent. Thank you so much. Hi. And uh, we also have Mark. Mark, can you introduce yourself? I am a speculative and horror fiction writer. I also write true ghost stories and I consider myself an all-around book nerd. I am thrilled to be here. I love these episodes. Awesome. <laughs> we're super excited to be doing this with you guys. So tonight, the order that we're going in is first we're going to do DC Gomez's Plague Unleashed. Very exciting. And the second one we're going to do is Mark Leslie's From Out of the Night, which has been annotated specifically for this episode. And then we're going to do mine, Corrupted Magic. So uh, we also have a couple of giveaways tonight of physical yes. books. Get excited. This is a really big deal. 
Um, so yeah, maybe we could mention that now, or maybe we could uh, talk about it right before each of you go. I don't know. What do you think is best? We could, uh, DC, why don't you tell us about yours, especially since you're going to go first? Sure. So I'm going to be giving away Plague Unleashed, which is the book that I'm going to be talking about. So because, you know, in the U.S. is, you know, Halloween was yesterday. Tomorrow is going to be the Day of the Dead, which happens to be my mom's birthday, as well as my main character's birthday. You know, no coincidence there at all. <laughs> so, so if anybody gets the question, so which start thinking about is, who are the four horsemen of the apocalypse? You get this copy and it will be mailed everywhere. So anywhere. So we'll make that happen for everybody. Awesome. Awesome. And why, why don't we just say what Mark says, and then you can tell us again after um, when when it's actually your turn to do your live read. Okay. Just tell us what yours is too. Uh, I'm going to be because Halloween. I'm going to be giving out Halloween treats. It's a mini story collection, just some spooky tales to keep the season going for the whole year. Uh, and then uh, Nocturnal Screams Ode to Classics again, more creepy Twilight Zoney kind of stories. Separately, of course, so that you know two different people can win the mini books awesome that sounds great did you already say the question you're or is it a random person that's going to get it or oh i didn't asking? yeah sorry the, the question is uh because the the story we're going to be reading from is about a woman's sort of unrealistic fears or over-the-top fears what is something that you are over the top afraid of something maybe a, a strange phobia could be it just be something that you're really really frightened of and i'd prefer it be something that's not real like you know i'm afraid of Bigfoot coming into my tent when I'm camping, <laughs> which is probably not realistic. Let's hope not, anyway. Not bears, well, like, Bigfoot. Why don't we go around the table here and start with Dave Kelly and ask him what is what's he most afraid of? Cats. 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 Nice. Didn't guess that one. How about you, Christy? Oh well, this isn't real either. But uh, the girl from the ring. That's my biggest fear. Um, I think she's stalking me, so I'm in for it. That's it. <laughs> I'm done. Nice. DC? I'm actually afraid of scary story, but I have lots of horror elements in my books. So I'm not the girl who's ever going to go watch a scary movie. It's not going to happen. Like th That industry is not going to get my money. I was like, sorry, I, I'm just not going to make it. <laughs> and Mark, since this is your question. What are you most afraid of? I know you said something earlier, but I, I said uh, Bigfoot when I'm when I'm camping. Not afraid of bears coming into the tent, but Bigfoot coming into the tent. I'm afraid of the the, the strange things, not the realistic ones. Awesome, it's so funny. That it's is about yourself, Richard. I'm afraid of answering this question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. You're afraid we're going to send stuff to you, aren't you? Exactly. No, I'm not going to reveal myself. That's right. I'm not coming out. So. Oh my god. <laughs> So if we're going to read DC's first, and, and her question was uh, to win uh, one of her books, a signed copy, I would imagine. Uh, okay. Her question was, uh, name the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And uh, we tasked David uh, with that, uh, trying to spell apocalypse and <laughs> before the show started. <laughs> I'm not sure how well he did, but uh, if you want to set uh, your story up, DC, and uh, we'll uh, get ready and get into character and you can take it away. I'm so, so excited to have you guys join me. We're going to be reading Chapter 7 from Plague Unleashed. This is book two in the Intern Diary series. So it is going to be, Isis is my main character. Oh my God, David, I love you. I love you so much right now. Thank you. <laughs> so much I love you. Oh my God. <laughs> I love you guys. So yeah, so we're going to get into the book. I am going to be giving you guys the narrations of Isis because the book's from her point of view. And this is literally the beginning of the madness that happens in the Reaper's universe where you get to have Isis thinks she's been seeing zombies running around Texarkana. Constantine, the cat, aka David, is trying to tell her not to say the C word no. ever. He does talk, so you're okay. So this is what happens when they finally have a dead semi-zombie and death is not happy so you guys ready you guys look amazing <laughs> let's do this chapter seven a ride from bobby ferguson park was quick and uneventful we're all lost in thought not even constantine spoke during the whole drive and he was notorious for his ongoing commentary we looked like a funeral procession when we entered the loft death was by the glass window staring at the first floor or at least i thought she was i never considered how far in distance or in time Death was able to penetrate. Those thoughts were too spooky for me to ponder. The art then was, she was holding a mug. 
I hope you don't mind that I finished your coffee, Bob. You have a fabulous blend. I had no idea Bob had his own blend of coffee. I was a tea and hot chocolate drinker, so I never asked. Not at all, boss lady. I'll make some more. Bob rushed to the fridge to grab his blend. I wasn't sure why Bob kept his coffee in the refrigerator. How bad is it? Constantine was now wasting time beating around the bush. He jumped on the dining table and got comfortable. Bartholomew and I looked at each other and then followed suit. We each took a chair on the far side of the table so that we could see everyone better. Is there a text? I'm sorry, mine is gray. Oh, oh, sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. Can you read it? I can't actually I, see it's it. Okay. It's gray at the bottom. <laughs> it's okay. So this is death. So if it's any consolation, he wasn't a walking dead. Death took one sip of her coffee and placed the mug on the kitchen island. She turned to face the rest of us, waiting for the information to register. Does that mean we don't have a zombie problem? That's a good thing, right? But Tholima was optimistic. But by the look on Death's face, we were in trouble. My dear, it's worse. He wasn't dead, but he wasn't human. Whatever happened to him somehow fragmented his consciousness. Death had turned back around to face the glass again. Death? What happened to its soul? Constantine said the words very softly, almost afraid to ask. It's gone. Gone? Not again. Is someone stealing souls again? How is that possible if he was moving around? I wasn't in the mood for more angry witches. Not really stolen. More like, more like not truly connected. Death turn around. Let me explain. This might be an oversimplification, so bear with me. When a human being dies, the mind and the soul forge into one, and they transcend the body. They become part of the higher consciousness. The mind grounds the soul to this world while the soul waits for nirvana. Hence the reason we can transport them, transport them to their next stage. In the case of this boy, his mind was gone. There was nothing there to direct in the soul in the process. It, so the soul just vanished from existence. Bob. So Bob says, is that what happens to people who are in the vegetable state? Bob asked from the kitchen counter as he poured Death more coffee. He handed Death her mug. Thank you, Bob. Not really. In a vegetable state, the soul and mind are fully conscious while the body is the one not reacting. The process is still the same. In this case, something had altered the process and created an abnormal condition I can't explain. The fact that Death couldn't explain was even scarier than anything else. Just to confirm, wow. You don't have a soul? Constantine asked. Death shook her head. That was the reason she was upset. A soul was lost and there was no way for us to find it. It was, we were in some serious trouble. How many more are there? She was looking out the window again as she spoke. He was the third one I seen, but the only one that died. I volunteered the information since nobody else was going to. Complicated. They are vicious and dangerous, but if you kill them, their souls end up in limbo. We need to figure out what causes this and reverse it. In the meantime, find a way to contain the victims and not kill them. Death looked at us expectantly. Unfortunately, Isis, your gifts will not work on them since their consciousness is gone. Oh, this was getting better and better. That's all. For a moment, I thought this would be hard. You wouldn't have to know exactly who is causing this by any chance. Constantine was dripping with sarcasm that apparently death ignores and she smiled. I can only think of one being capable of causing these results. Bartholomew, dear, do you mind connecting me to my sister Pestilence, please? Bartholomew, Bartholomew jumped from his seat and headed for his command center. Big screen? He asked as he approached the desk. Of course, nothing small for her. Death answered as she walked behind him. Sister? Dad has a sister? I asked Constantine in the most urgent tone I could find while keeping my voice low. Of course, she's the oldest of four, duh. Constantine replied that I was supposed to know this. Wait, what? Dad has two more siblings? I was dumbfounded. When did this happen? Constantine walked over to me and slapped me over the head. Ouch! 
I yell, not because it hurt, but the prince of the matter. Thank God his claws were not extended. Seriously, girl, aren't you Catholic or something? Doesn't Father Francis have Sunday school classes for adults? He was looking serious. I was Catholic, but probably not a very good one by the looks of it. I'm so lost, Constantine. Just tell me. I was too proud. I wasn't too proud to ask. You'd heard of the book of Revelation, last one in the Bible? Ring a bell? Constantine was looking at me, focused as he spoke, so I just nodded. I was afraid to open my mouth and sound even more dumb. That's a blessing. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are death and the rest of the siblings. Oh God, is Judgment Day coming? Is this the apocalypse? My voice cracked. Was I on the verge of the panic attack? How did I miss this? If I worked for death, that meant the other three horsemen were also real. I was going to faint. Isis, calm the hell down and shut up. There's no apocalypse happening. That only happens when all four horsemen get together, and this hardly warrants a family reunion. By the way, that piece of information was in your manual. When are you planning to read the damn thing? Constantine had a way of stopping my rambling hysterics with facts. I was going to burn that manual. Um, well, I wasn't sure how to reply. Yes, spit it out. Wow. Constantine did not wait patiently at all. I thought it only covered the French benefits, and Bartholomew explained those. I didn't think you will explain wall destruction and employ manual. Anyways, what is Pestilence like? I wanted to change the subject as quickly as possible. Bien. <laughs> oh, that was great. That was great, DC. I loved it. <laughs> you guys did awesome. I need to keep you around. Like, this is so much fun. <laughs> No, I, I apologize. I jumped in on the wrong line and I missed mine. Sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> yeah, for some reason at the bottom of my screen where my line was, it was totally great. And that's my word. I have no idea why I did that. So oh, sorry. Wow. <laughs> you trusted word? <laughs> <Yeah>. Right? <laughs> my mistake. <laughs> no, I love that. That was really, really cool. <laughs> yeah. David, you've been taken thing. over by your fear. You're a cat. <laughs> And I we have that. an answer to one of the questions. I'm over the top, afraid of entering into a haunted house and encountering a sudden unexplained cold touch, banging noise, and random hairy spider hanging from a broken chandelier. Whoa. That's very specific. That's really good. <laughs> and then she answered the other one as well. Four horsemen of the apocalypse are conquest, war, famine, and death. And Hillary says, mine is very basic. She's afraid of mice. She's terrified of mouth. Nice. Oh. I mean, absolutely terrified. If your if your fear and her fear got together, would your fear chase her fear away? <laughs> I tried my best. I tried my best. That's awesome. It's kind of perfect, actually. And uh, great job, guys. That was that was very good. Really. So fun. we have Mark's coming up next, and uh, Mark, your question again was. What are you afraid of? <laughs> what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Um, so setting up a story, this is a complete short story. It's an abridged version of a story called From Out of the Night. And uh, and I think uh, DC is going to kick us off with the narratorial voice from the manuscript. Are you guys ready? Yep, my costume doesn't really change. I'm still trying to look like a kid. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> Let's start. From Out of the Night. Although technology dominates our world, there still exist things that have been with us since we huddle in caves around brightly burning fires and avoided ominous shadows. Strange beings of the night become frighteningly real to us even now as we venture into the 21st century. Unknown things are still out there going bump in the night, a night where most of our dreams are nightmares. Scientifically, we have grown out of the dark ages, but our fears will forever remain among other frightened figures jumping at shadows outside the caves, and perhaps for good reason. Here they come! Mary's screech from the kitchen came to Jack over the baby monitor. Jack was in his basement then, putting the finishing touches on another non-fiction book about fear and the unknown. On the nearby shelf sat several of his more popular texts, one on Bigfoot, another on the Loch Ness Monster, several on UFOs, and the books about a popular television series featuring a pair of FBI paranormal investigators back in the 90s. Upon hearing Mary's voice, 
he leaned back, ran his finger. We sound effects very nice. <laughs> ran his fingers along the base of the keyboard and turned the screen off. Regretfully nodding to his unfinished project, he got to his feet and headed upstairs. Unseen by Mary, he stood silently and observed his wife peering out the kitchen window. He studied her familiar features, thinking of how often he saw her, but didn't really look. Her worn face gave the impression of someone much older than her 43 years. She stood over the kitchen counter, silent for a moment. Her expression told him her mind was racing furiously. When their teenage son entered the room, Mary's head swung to orient on him. John, the lights! John clicked the kitchen light off in haste. He then moved to the front door and locked it. Are they back again, Mom? <laughs> Mary gazed proudly at her son as he locked the door. Smart move. And yes, they're back. She twisted to look out the window again. There go a few of them now, to Mrs. Hancock's house. Oh, and there's another two coming up the side of the street. Oh! She ducked. I don't think they saw me. Uh, why are there so many of them this time, Mom? Because they're growing in strength and in number. They feed our fear and prey on the weak-minded. They coerce others into becoming just like them. And they won't be satisfied until everyone is bloodthirsty and flesh-eating like they are. They won't stop until everyone has become. A burst of laughter filled the room and Mary jumped, swinging her head in the direction of the living room. A smile of relief crossed her face and Jack could tell, even before she spoke, that it had only been the canned laughter of a television sitcom audience. Susie! Mary shrieked. Turn off that TV! Another wave of laughter from the studio audience flooded the darkened room. Mary turned to face her son. Listen, John, take your sister and go down to the basement. Tell your father to shut off his den lights and you hide with him there. I don't want those cannibals to get anywhere near you two. Do you hear me? As Jack watched them, a nave of nostalgia overcame him. It was so obvious her only concern was for her children. She was willing to sacrifice herself for them without a second thought. It made Jack pine for the days when their own love had been so unselfish. But that had been years ago, before their relationship had evolved into something more mature, something increasingly less demonstrative. It was nothing like his active love for his writing. It was simply there. While John went into the living room to get his little sister, Jack moved silently into the kitchen. His eyes met Mary's as the light and noise of the television stopped. In a thickened darkness, they looked at each other and listened to their children stumble to the stairway. I love you. Mary whispered at the sounds in the dark. When they were gone, she addressed her husband. The kids will be safer down there, hidden away. They won't have to access to them. Why don't you go downstairs with the kids, hon? Jack suggested. Let me handle them tonight. No. I'm not defenseless. I can protect my family just fine. Now get back downstairs and look after my children. They're going to need you. Mary, please. He reached out to rub her shoulder. I can protect us. Flinching back from his touch, Mary glared at him. No, no, you can't. If you'd wanted to protect us, you would have put, up, put the boards up like I suggested. We don't need the boards, Mary. Jack thought back to the year before when she'd insisted he nail boards over the windows and doors. They'd stayed in the boarded-up house for three days. Fortunately, the kids were able to do online learning, so they didn't miss school. And Jack's writing was always done from home, so it hadn't been much of a hardship. But he couldn't justify using the boards this year. The nuisance was just too much. His manuscript was already overdue, and his agent was calling three times a day. Yes, we do need the boards. They're the only thing that saved us last time. She crossed her arms and paced the kitchen, pacing the kitchen. What about Mr. and Mrs. Allen, two doors down? They, don't, they didn't board up their house last year, and look what's happened to them. They're becoming. They may not be consuming flesh yet, but you can tell they've started to change. You can see it in their eyes. Becoming doesn't happen overnight, Jack. It has to grow and fester inside them over time. It's a horrible process of self-induced pain and suffering. Mary, I honestly don't think it was because of the boards. We'd be perfectly safe without them. You're right. The Allens were weak. Ted and Lisa couldn't resist their supernatural charms and promises of immortality. But they wouldn't have had to resist them had they boarded themselves up inside. She picked up the window once more. Oh, damn. We forgot to turn off the outside porch light. 
Quick, get the switch. Get the switch. Jack reached for the light switch. Too late. She cried. Too damn late. A group of them have already spotted the light. They're drawn to it like moths, Jack. Like sick, disgusting insects. She swallowed noisily and ran a hand down the side of her face. Looks like I'm going to have to finally face them. Well, at least you and the kids will be safely hidden. Jack couldn't even remember the words of comfort he used to be able to find when Mary needed his strength. Despite the desperation in her voice, his mind kept wandering back to his unfinished manuscript. No matter how hard he tried, he wanted nothing more than to go downstairs and to continue writing. Feeling like a poser, he tried again. Mary, please, go downstairs and let me handle it. No, you don't know all their tricks, Jack. You have to be invited. They have to be invited in. They can only corrupt those who invite them in. There's no need for all of us to be exposed. Besides, I'm the strongest minded. Maybe they won't be able to convert me. I should be able to resist them. You're right. Jack sighed. She was one stubborn lady, impossible to sway once her mind was set. I'll go downstairs and wait with the kids. Good luck, Mary. He headed for the basement stairs. Wait, Jack. Before you go, promise me something. He paused on the top step. It would kill me to corrupt my own family, but that's what they do. That's how they survive, isn't it? By making others like them? Promise me that if, after this meeting with them tonight, if I become, you'll take the children far away from me. Promise me you'll do everything you can to prevent the kids from becoming. Promise me that. Jack took a deep breath. I promise. A heavy knock sounded through the darkness. This is it. He leaned back against the counter and sighed. I'll wait a minute and make sure you're safely hidden. I love you. A tear came to Jack's eye. He brushed it away. I love you too, Mary. The words rolled off his tongue like a forgotten language. He quickly moved down the stairs. When he got to the den, he closed the door behind him and sat in the armchair near the computer. Susie ran over to him, jumped into his lap, and threw her arms around him. She was trembling. Over the baby monitor, he could hear Mary's footsteps upstairs as she moved to open the door. Turning the monitor off, suppressed, uh, suppressing a chuckle. It's all right, Susie. It's okay. Mommy's going to be okay. Susie found courage in her father's eyes and voice. Jack was slightly irritated at how Mary's behavior had frightened their daughter. John understood what was wrong with his mother, but Susie being four was still too young to make sense of it. All she knew was that mommy was scared to death of those Christians. The Christians with their non-scientific belief in life after death, resurrection of the dead, and their weekly consumption of their Savior's flesh and blood. Mary was a perfect wife and mother in all other respects, so what was so wrong in having one paranoid delusion? It was natural. Jack based his living on other people's paranoid delusions and fears. It helped to feed his family. And besides, it was a simple, harmless paranoia. It's it's not like Mary would ever hurt anybody. Suddenly inspired, Jack told the children to watch the television in the room across the hall, so long as they kept the door closed and the volume low. He brought his hands down gently on the keyboard and, smiling, wrote what he felt would be a satisfying conclusion to the introductory chapter. Irritation occurs in the true believer's heart when science or the reason of daylight find rational ways of knocking their beliefs and fears. But given the fact that proving the non-existence of anything is virtually impossible, Fear continues to haunt us. We're persuaded from our of the night of by dreams of the unknown and visions of the unexplainable, the unreal. Even if one day proof is given that our fear created beings do not actually exist, we will probably invent new ones. The doorway to the den opened, startling Jack out of his reverent typing. He looked up as Mary's throaty laugh filled the room. <laughs> I did it, Jack, she said. I protected my family from them. They're never going to get us now. Mary stood in the doorway clutching a blood-stained butcher knife and smiled a bright white tooth grin at him from beneath the coat of deep crimson on her face. He looked at her a moment and realized the frightening truth. There were no more monsters out there. Ghosts, vampires, witches, and boogeymen had all been vanquished. Monsters, creatures of the night, and ghouls had all been conquered and there was no need to create new ones. The only monsters left were the ones inside our own hearts. The demon thoughts that allowed Mary to obsess over something she was afraid of until the insanity finally consumed her. The spirits of selfishness that allowed Jack to simply overlook her problems because he was too busy focusing on himself and his writing. Those personal monsters that people never want to face. 
were the only nightmares left. These thoughts, his most brilliant conclusion yet, would never make it to the printed page because for the first time in eight years, Jack completely forgot about his writing as he got up, went over to his wife, and held her while she wept. That was awesome. All that was. Nice sound effects. <laughs> that was really clever. <laughs> Thanks for covering for me when I accidentally kicked myself out of the room. <laughs> I figured you were coming back. I'm like, I'll, I'll yeah. keep talking while you come back. It would be no, great. No, that was great, TC. I was about to do the same thing, and you jumped in. That was awesome. <laughs> I was like, I figured I was the commentator so I can narrate, and nobody will actually notice. So I wasn't supposed to say that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so while you were, we were reading Mark's story, uh, Wanda wrote a story of her own for us here. Ooh. My biggest... Outrageous Ooh. fear is cacti, and if you keep going on, uh, she's uh, beyond terrified of spiders. Tarantulas lay eggs inside cacti, and then they hatch and eat the inside of the cacti. As they get bigger and bigger, it causes the cactus they're in to shake, and eventually the cactus will explode, yeah. sending spiders flying everywhere. I know their X-ray. I know the X-ray cacti are looking for nests and eggs before importing cacti. However, I will never have a cactus in my house, and if you have one in your house that uh, I visit, I may just toss a blanket. <laughs> I am not going to look at cactus the same anymore either now. No. Thanks a lot. Oh my god, yeah. That's sickening. I didn't. I was loading cactuses with spiders flying out of them. I have a friend who collects them. I was never cactus terrified of cactus, spiders. but now I am. Exploding yeah, now cactuses. I am still. Yeah. No cactus. <laughs> I won't uh, be going back to visit him anytime soon. No kidding. That is crazy. <laughs> Beware the dancing cacti. Ooh. We were down in Bon Air a few years ago and it was just full of cacti. I would see some. Glad I didn't know this. This is unacceptable that is, knowledge. That is scary, Wanda. I think I have a new fear now. Thanks yeah. A lot. <laughs> I'm not even gonna go sleep now. All that detail, that was that was too much. <laughs> I think Wanda oh, should write her own story about cacti and exploding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ew. So that was okay. great. And don't forget, people, we still have a if anyone wants to answer those questions, who are the four horsemen of the apocalypse and what are you definitely afraid of or what's your weirdest fear? Uh, exploding cacti is definitely a weird fear. <laughs> Although it doesn't seem that weird anymore. So Christy, I guess we'll be reading your next. And if you want to set us up and I will get uh, into my costume. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. So this is uh, an episode of Corrupted Me Magic. Too. This is episode 12 called A Big Mistake. And it takes place in Boston in 1850. And this is during a time when Irish immigration was high and there was extreme prejudice against the Irish. And that comes a little bit in this, uh, in this particular episode. So um, in the lead up to, because like I said, this is episode 12. So a lot has already happened. You guys are looking fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Um, the Grimoire Society of Dark Acts, which is our, our main group, is being threatened by the Ruin Rats, and they're a magical Victorian street gang. So years ago, our main character, Humphrey Bullington, Dark Acts Oracle, escaped Philadelphia without paying a hefty de gambling debt. And it turns out that the men that he gambled with were part of the Ruin Rats. So they were a street gang, and now they're after him and Dark Acts too. So Dark Acts has just discovered that the Ruins the Ruin Rat's magical ability is magic bending, and that's something brand new and very dangerous since it uses and bends everyone's magic, so it turns it against them, um, or it can negate their magic. So um, briefly, I'll just tell you, Carmichael, um, who is the leader of Dark Acts, uh, has decided to gather a council of the best of each category from the magical societal universe. So that's where we are right now. We pick up where the new council has gathered in the library of the Dark Acts house. So we have a whole bunch of Victorian people with fun facial hair and, <laughs> and great costumes like Lucy hair. So, you know, I'm super excited for you guys. Um, there's a couple of super arrogant people. There's a couple of, there's a really low class person. There's like a, a lot of variety in here. So, I'll be doing the narration. Everybody else will be doing characters. So here we go. We're in Carmichael's perspective. All invited members of Carmichael's council had agreed to be part of it in rather a hurried way. Some seemed panicked, some simply interested in helping. All five waited before him now in the library, ready for his explanation. But first, etiquette. All of you know me. Carmichael said with some amount of pride. 
But do you all know each other? We don't have time for formal introductions, of course. But you are all among the best people in your respective societal, societal categories. <clears throat> Carmichael couldn't look at Jasper Hughes when he said that. Yeah, bog shite. <laughs> and so I shall make a brief introduction of each of you. Carmichael gestured toward Nigel Montague, whose slicked back hair and fine taste in clothes mimicked his own. Although Carmichael would never wear anything so heavily patterned or light in color. Mr. Nigel Montague is the master of ceremonies for the Light Side Society of Truth. The same role as my good self in Dark Acts. Nigel is highly accomplished, as you can imagine, and quite knowledgeable. We have a lot in common. Can barely tell you two dandies apart. Jasper murmured. Ignoring him, Nigel said. I think that's Mark. You're muted, Mark. Sorry. Shouldn't you have introduced the ladies first? He said with the mic muted. <laughs> Carmichael huffed. Well, of course I should have, but doesn't that just show you how urgent all of this is? Don't interrupt. Quickly gesturing toward a lady before Nigel could argue further, Carmichael continued. Miss Grace Garstead is... She raised her head and smiled as if she were already pleased with herself. At the forefront of the Guild of Grace, a prime example of the ideal enchantress, inventor of the dictation quill, which needs an update, by the way. Perhaps a dictation fountain pen sometime soon. Hmm? Mm. Irritation flashed across Grace's pretty face as she crinkled her tiny little nose, satisfying Carmichael. She kept her delicate pale hands gently clasped in front of the layered skirt of her fashionable pink day dress, and Carmichael did his best to ignore how ridiculously perfect she was. Too perfect. He's teasing you, Florence said to Grace, her expression gently admonishing Carmichael. Yes, he has quite a habit of teasing me. Grace retorted through full pink lips. Really, that level of perfection shouldn't be allowed. How annoying. Carmichael moved on. We are fortunate to have Mr. Drew Morton, who leads the Boston creatorship of weaponry. Without him, perhaps our societies would never have had the option of commissioning bladed jacks. So dangerous, I don't believe anyone has ever asked for a set yet. Have they? For fear they might be injured in the fray. Better is protection in outside society houses in, than in one-to-one -one combat, I have discovered. Morton said, his long, curled black mustache bouncing as he spoke. Ooh, we must hear about that sometime. Carmichael rubbed his hands together and turned his attention to the next council member. You will appreciate Miss Florence Violet, who leads the field in discovering the almost invisible difference between magical and non-magical plants. Oh, yeah, that's what I said, plants. Never mind her creation by cross-pollination of the soul flower. He looked at her proudly as if it was his own achievement. It had been too long since he'd had Florence to the house. As soon as there was a moment's peace, he'd have to have her for tea or lunch. Florence smiled, blushing and looking down ever the shrinking violet. I'm developing something new as we speak. I think you'll find it particularly interesting, James. Oh, I'm sure, dear. He said. After this disaster is averted, you'll have my full attention for that. Her blush deepened. Perhaps the attention was too much for her. And last but not, well, this is Jasper Hughes, expert in mystical creatures and the best tamer I personally know. There could be better. Jasper crossed his arms in his slightly wrinkled suit and Carmichael couldn't help but stare at a frayed edge on one of his lapels. Keep talking so we can cut in. And now that we have that out of the way. This better not be some kind of exaggeration, you daffy down dilly. I don't <laughs> want to hear nothing about it. And I, that ain't bad now that you drag me here. Jasper's rudeness complimented his beastly hulking presence just as much as his unstyled, messy brown hair and thick mutton chops did. His broad facial features sat in a permanent scowl. And this ogre, of all men, was married. Carmichael felt his lips Aye. tighten and his eye twitched as he tried his hardest not to get annoyed. 
first of all, if you're going to use slang in my house to insult me, I will not have outdated slang. Florence puckered her lips, but her grin still showed. And second of all, it is as bad as I said. What would you think if I told you there was now such a thing as magic bending? Mm. Carmichael was met by blank stares from the member of his new members of his new council. I'd say you'd die. Jasper snarled. That's even older slang. Carmichael said, pinching the bridge of his nose. Carmichael? Is that what it sounds like? Morton asked. Now, Morton was a man Carmichael could respect. He might not be as refined, but he was a very logical, reasonable man who wore a good suit. Bending magic. What exactly does that mean? It is just as it sounds. From what we know so far, magic bending seems to somehow enable one to use others' magic and bend it to their will. Our own oracle's crystal ball was turned against him. They used it to travel to another location, something even he can't do. And our rune, Maven Stone, was bent to their will. Neither man was rune master, as far as I know, so you can imagine how disturbing that was. Nigel sat down on the tete a tete couch and leaned on dark wood on the dark wood of the low armrest. These men you're referring to, who are they? The ruin rats. Carmichael explained. How it all started is personal business between them and our oracle, and it's irrelevant. They've shown us that there is a new category of magic, and the worst news is it's unbalanced. I hope you've all been diligently analyzing your societal universe diagrams like you should. Carmichael paused but got no response. He put his hands on his hips. Well, thank goodness I've been watching them. That's how I discovered something was changing. Now I know what. Grace shook her head. Are you trying to say this category of magic is forming all by itself and nothing to contract or balance it? Hmm. She scoffed. That's simply impossible. It doesn't work like that. Are you sure you have this right? Carmichael dropped his hands dramatically. If I hadn't looked at them over and over again and then put two and two together with this magic bending gang, would I have gone to all the trouble to... All right, all right, Grace said, her delicate hands gesturing to quiet him. I was merely asking. So what are we talking about? Are we going to crush this gang? Jasper said, his scowl intensifying. Don't be such a barbarian. Of course we won't crush them. Carmichael rolled his eyes. I called this council because, well, I wanted your opinions. Come now, don't be so afraid of directly asking for help. Carmichael opened his mouth to rephrase his request, but he couldn't bring himself to ask. Help from Jasper just seemed like too much of an opportunity for him to gloat. Florence nodded eagerly. I'm not sure how I can help, but I'd like to. Give me something I, to give you an opinion on. Morton pushed. He put one arm across his waist, the opposite elbow sitting on top of it, his index finger and thumb stroking his clean-shaven chin. Well, all right then. Carmichael started, unsure where to go. For the first time in a very long time, he had no answer. His mind ran quickly, looking for some solution. He always had one, but come up, came up with nothing at all. Still, he opened his mouth to speak. Say something, anything. Just get the discussion moving toward a solution. Oh, uh, we should invite them to discuss their new magic. Breathtakingly stupid. His eyes shot to Jasper and narrowed at him, daring him to say something insulting. Actually, Morton said, that isn't a bad idea. Perhaps we could claim we're including them in this council so that we can talk to them calmly, try to find out what exactly their intentions are, and offer them some sort of membership, or even offer to be allies. An unbecoming cough of a noise came from the back of Grace's throat. <coughs> you want to invite a gang into our miss? Don't you find that slightly dangerous? Mm. She's right. 
Nigel said, concentrating on the floor while he spoke. If they really can fend magic, as you say, what's to stop them from using a meeting like that as an opportunity to, in this worst case scenario, kill us all? The very reason you invited us here is because we are the heads of our groups and we are at the top of our particular types of society. What a perfect chance for them to take advantage of that if they should be so inclined. And I assume they would be since you refer to them as a gang. He looked up at Carmichael from the tete-a-tete. Ruin rats? Unsavory characters at best, I'm sure. When you can tell... Quite a lot from a name. One can tell quite a lot from a name. <laughs> he chuckled and looked at Florence. The next thing you know, he'll be inviting the dead rabbits. Carmichael's lips thinned and his eyes intentionally, unintentionally widened as he tried to keep himself from sharing the news of their literal invitation to the Dark Act house. He swallowed hard. When Nigel looked at him, Carmichael looked away and stared straight at the books behind the rest of the group. You didn't. I must research how to keep a straight face when telling a lie or withholding information. Nigel stood and faced Carmichael. You called in one gang to deal with another? Have you gone completely mad? Jasper raised an eyebrow. They both pro-Irish? Again, Carmichael's lips flattened without his consent. Jasper's mouth dropped open. You'd be looking for a gang war. I can't remember why I thought it was a good idea to call upon dead rabbits anymore. Grace looked uncomfortable because Grace Garstead's real name was a very Irish Neem Gallagher before she'd changed it twice, which Carmichael had felt, found out only by digging into her background quite deeply to find out her pedigree, something he'd never shared with anyone despite his dislike of her. It was a mercy she had the purest blonde hair, unlike Finnegan's flaming red hair that put a target on his chest. Her green eyes threatened to give her away, but without any other outward signs of her descent, they were simply considered another part of her incredible beauty. If the sophisticated non-magical circles she socialized in got even a whiff of her Irishness, they wouldn't have her. Grace was only lucky to be brought over to America by her parents from Ireland at such a young age that she had not one trace of an accent. It kept her safe in such trying times. Morton ruled him in his lips and stared at the ceiling for a moment in a clear attempt to calm himself before he finally said, A gang war, and what will almost certainly become a societal battle all at the same time. Not one of your best ideas, Carmichael. His tone still held suppressed frustration, but who could blame him? That ugly feeling of not being good enough started creeping up on him the one he'd always fought off since the grimoire chose him to lead dark acts. That moment had been life-changing, and he wasn't about to succumb to his old feelings of inadequacy from his old life. Not yet, anyway. Don't forget, Carmichael said, almost talking to himself. We are some of the best out of each of our societal categories. We can overcome anything with magic and in collaboration. The question is, Nigel said, looking hard into Carmichael's eyes. When our magic is used against us, are we still the best? <laughs> Good one. Fantastic. I really enjoyed that. You guys were awesome. You were all so fantastic. I loved it. That was awesome. No, that was fun to read. I'd pleasure, man. Fun scene. You did awesome, Christy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love the outfits, too. <laughs> so we had a bunch of comments come in here. I was going to whip through them as we were talking. You guys go ahead and keep talking. Ow. I'll pop them up. <laughs> David ends Sorry, up there's... accidentally waxing his lip every single time. We have to have a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dave always gets typecast for the most outlandish characters. <laughs> for some reason, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> It was, it was the facial hair. I knew you could do the facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> nice mutton chops. I mean, that's David's character. Sure. <laughs> the problem was having to swap between them. That was somewhat difficult. <laughs> you handle it really well. Yeah. <laughs> I had to go through the whole manuscript and stuff like, how close do these people talk together? You know, because it's like, I mean, am I going to yeah. be... 
I know. <laughs> <You're doing great. laughs> the challenge. So, so for any of our uh, new uh, people that are watching now, uh, there are a couple of guests, if, uh, questions that are asked by Mark Leslie and DC Gomez if you want to win a, a free copy of uh, one of their books. And Mark's was... Uh, what is your creepiest fear or your strangest fear? And uh, DC's was who are the four horsemen of the apocalypse? So uh, before we sign off, if uh, anyone wants to comment on those, and we'll enter you in the draw. It looks like Hillary's uh, put forth the four horsemen as well, death, famine, war, and conquest. I'm kind of thinking there might be David, Richard, uh, Mark, and we'll have to find another bad person. To skip <laughs> what if someone's afraid of the four horsemen? <laughs> yeah, that would, yeah. That would like win everything, wouldn't it? <laughs> Sounds right. afraid of war, death, famine, and yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Laura, I can't. It's hard to say that name, Lorio. Well, I'm not sure what the the whole thing is there, but uh, there is definitely a new uh, guest to Lurking for Legends. I've never seen that name before, so welcome, uh, welcome, welcome to our podcast. And he says excellent readings and. Caroline says, wash hands, wash hands, wash hands. And not uh, the that, the time period. that was the <laughs> symbol, I think, wasn't it? Oh, I see. Oh. Amazing, all so much fun. And then Chrissy's uh, Screams, Ode to the Classics. What's that, Dave? Nocturnal Screams, Ode to the Classics. It's uh, one of, one of the books. books. Oh, okay, awesome. I don't know why it separated it like that. Oh, that's cool. Mark, how many books do you have out? You probably have about 5,982 books out now. Yeah. <laughs> about 30. 30, yeah. Yeah. I said when Mark was on the show a few weeks ago that every time we do a book signing when Mark's there, uh, you can barely see Mark. It's a good thing he's so tall because he's just buried behind the mountain of books. Oh, my goodness. DC, I think you're on your way there. Don't you have like 15 or is it 20? 18. 18, 18. 18. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's we awesome. We got some prolific people among us. <laughs> Good for me to do. To do. <laughs> for people who don't sleep. Oh, we don't sleep. That's the other There's thing. There's no probably lack of sleep. <laughs> we'll sleep when we're dead. We'll sleep when the four horsemen come. <laughs> That's pretty much it. It's lack of sleep. <laughs> so... Most people won't know what Mark's uh, actually front yard would look like. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to live close to Mark, and I know uh, he had an amazing Halloween display. Uh, <gasps> did you spend the whole day taking it down to you, or is it still out there? No, I took most of it down. I only have two. I had the shark still left and two of the skeletons in the water with the beach ball. Uh, we did Jaws theme. Uh, so we did, oh, we did a funny. beach. We did a blue tarp for water. We had a shark fin and all the skeleton because we have skeletons, lots of skeletons, so we use them. They're sitting on the beach. One of them was in a life raft station. We had the big sign that said, Welcome to Amity Beach from Jaws and um, oh Beach Closed. Of course, there were the stupid skeletons are still swimming. So. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's great. That's so much fun. Well, they were already dead. So, I mean, it doesn't matter, does it? That's true. The, 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 the shark's not going not gonna to get well fed there. <laughs> Did you put Barnaby out there? Is he making new friends? Barnaby, so the new the the newest skeleton I always get, I keep him preserved. He's he's he was in my car, uh, so he <laughs> comes to shows with me and stuff. And then as as they wear out, and I buy new ones, the new one becomes Barnaby, and then the old ones just go into the Halloween decor. That's why we've got about eight skeletons. So <laughs> that's too. Funny. That is so awesome. You keep them in a cupboard. Uh, we have a shed, uh, a Halloween shed. <laughs> That's Richard has this big uh, this big thing he travels with for his books. I have a shed for Halloween decorations. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think one of the neatest things I seen doing a book signing was uh, we were up in Sudbury, which is David's hometown. We we're doing the Sudbury Graphicon in 2019, and we happened to have a stall next to uh, Mark, and he had uh, Barnaby sitting there. I'm not sure if it was the current Barnaby, but uh, you had some kind of I think a, like a doctor's uh, outfit on him or something, and some little child came up and uh, saw the skeleton sitting there, and then kind of peeked up. Underneath, <laughs> I wonder like, the <laughs> underneath the skirt. Yeah, it was it was comical. It was... <laughs> Just to see. Yeah. Is this anatomically correct? <laughs> I can I just we'll... imagine, for whatever reason, the police coming to your house and opening your shed and finding all these skeletons. No kidding, eh? No, I've been. Uh, I, I got stopped in a ride program at about one in the morning. I was heading uh, north to Sudbury, which is about a four. Our drive north of Toronto and Ontario, 
and the ride program, uh, checking to see if you're drinking and driving. And so I have Barnaby strapped into the passenger seat and I'm driving up. I was going for a, a book signing uh, the next day. I, you know, I left work and it, it was late. So he pulls me over and he says, have you been drinking? And I said, no. Uh, he says, uh, how about your buddy? I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Officer alcohol goes right through him. And then he got a serious look on his face and he says, seriously, what's with the stiff? <laughs> and and I said, well, officer, I'm heading north to Sudbury to launch Spooky Sudbury tomorrow. It's the big book launch. And I reach into the back seat where there's a box of the books. And I go, would you like a copy? I'll sign one for you. You'll have a good story to tell people. <laughs> but this crazy guy you stopped. <laughs> That's great. That probably is told every Thanksgiving or Christmas or whatever. <laughs> probably. He's like, yeah, I'll remember, I remember this one guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the last time I work a paid duty. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I do we not joke crossing the border, though. When I cross the border with them, I don't joke with the border guards. They're very. No, 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 no. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, don't do that. They're sent to you. Yeah. But before yeah, we head those out, guys have no sense of humor. <laughs> what, what's new, DC, with the with you? What, what do you got coming out next? Or where can we find your books? Uh, Easiest place to find this on my website. I have a book coming out the 20th of November. It's called The Traitor, which is book two on my oh, assassin awesome. series. And then I got Yay. really inspired by Christy. So I'm playing on Vela. So that has become an entire Yay. epic. It's such a strange platform. So I'm learning <laughs> Vela and trying to not like overwhelm myself. So this is the whole let's play on Vela master plan that I had this month. <laughs> yeah. It's Are you writing book. something on the fly for Vela? I'm actually converting short stories that I have published in anthologies and trying to make them fit this platform. So mm, it's cool. become quite interesting. That is did, cool. Did you, Great. did you not say you were a button pusher? Did you not say that? This is how I got yeah. stuck with Bella. This is and that's why I you're in Bella. That's right. That's what I thought. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is exactly how that went down. I was like, oh, look, Bella, let's do that. Please. They're like, oh, God. <laughs> like, what am I doing? I love it. That's awesome. I love that story when you told us that. So. And, and Mark, how about you? Uh, what's next for you coming out, and where can we find your books? NaNoWriMo. I'm co-authoring Hex in the City, which is book six in the Canadian Werewolf series. Uh, Julie Strauss and I are starting that this month. We're each going to write 50,000 words and then maybe cut it back down to 80 when we're done. In total. <laughs> <laughs> so it's coming out in March of 2023. Nice. Oh, congratulations. That would be neat. I but, like the title. That's such a yeah, key play. co-authoring. Yeah, co-authoring has been a, a fun experience. I, I, I had to really trust her to give her one of my characters and take take her point of view over. Mm -hmm. but, yes, uh, it's right. worked out really well. We did the, the last book, Lover's Moon, worked beautifully, and I thought, let's just keep going. So. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> and, well, thank you for joining us today, both of you. Uh, mm -hmm. And Christy, thank you for also sharing your excerpt as well. Yay. We always enjoy reading yeah. more about Corrupted Magic and... Uh, and we enjoy having you guys on, and uh, maybe we'll get you back for another live read. And if you guys ever want to come back on, if you got a new book coming out, uh, just let us know. We are now booking into August next year, so uh, you're going to have to plan ahead uh, if you want to come back. And uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you again for joining us. We had a lot of fun, and we really enjoyed your stories. And uh, we wish you both the best of luck. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Yeah. Thanks. So next week, uh, just before we leave. Uh, Next week, we'll be speaking to return guest Bruce Hansen. Bruce has received seven awards for children and adult short fiction and one for nonfiction. His stories are published in several anthologies, including Canadian Authors Association anthologies. Bruce is a member of the Barry Writers Club, the Muskoka Authors Association, and the Writers Community of York Region. And since Bruce is a returning guest, we have asked him to read us an excerpt from one of his stories. And Dave and Chrissy and I will uh, join in with that read. So we get to enjoy another a live read next week. Uh, so I look forward to that. So. For DC Gomez, Christy Stratos, Mark Leslie, David Kelly, and myself, we wish you all a great week ahead. Until we meet again, take good care. Good night.